Let's take a case scenario where a patient with a history of ingestion of an unknown chemical is brought into the emergency room. The first thing you noticed is the patient is having an altered sensorium with profuse lacrimation and salivation. You start examining and you notice the pupils which are constricted bilaterally and they are pinpoint. So, what is the first guess you would take as an attending physician? Yes, there is a very high probability that this is a case of organophosphate poisoning. Organophosphate poisoning is a medical emergency and diagnosis is strictly clinical. Now, the patient is complaining of tightness of the chest and on auscultation, you found wheezing sounds. When you took history, you found out that he had continuous vomiting, loose motions, urination, and GI distress in particular. This is a classic presentation of OPP poisoning. The next thing you need to do is atropinize the patient. If the patient is responding to atropinization it's confirmed that it is. But, how to do it, how to rule out OPP poisoning and how to manage it? Let's understand everything you need to know about organophosphate poisoning. Now, I want you to count the days of a week. Let's start from Monday, like Monday, M for meiosis, Tuesday, T for tachycardia, then, Wednesday equals weakness, Thursday equals hypertension, Friday equals fasciculations, Saturday for salivation and, Sunday, for seizure, but Sunday is a holiday, so seizure can be present or absent depending on the severity of toxicity, simple enough? Okay, or just remember a word, sludge. Sludge is used to describe the muscarinic manifestations as S for salivation, then lacrimation, urination, defecation, GI distress, and emesis. The more common mnemonic that captures the muscarinic effects of organophosphate poisonings is dumbbells. D for defecation or diaphoresis, U for urination, M for meiosis, B for bronchospasm or bronchorrhea, E for emesis, L for lacrimation and S for salivation. If you just remembered one of the above mnemonics, it will be really helpful in diagnosis of organophosphate poisoning in ER. Now, once you evaluated the patient, it's time to do the first thing. The first step in the management of patients with organophosphate poisoning is putting on personal protective equipment. These patients may still have the compound on them, and you must protect yourself from exposure. Secondly, you must decontaminate the patient. This means removing and destroying all clothing because it may be contaminated even after washing. The patient's skin needs to be flushed with water. Now, it's time to atropinize the patient. So what exactly is atropinization? Atropin is administered intravenously to restore adequate cardiorespiratory function rapidly, a process often termed atropinization. It is used to reverse bradycardia and improve systolic blood pressure to greater than 80 mmHg. At the same time, it aims to reduce bronchorrhea, reverse bronchospasm and improve oxygenation. In this case, auscultation can be used to confirm the lack of wheeze and crepitations. The initial dose for adults is 2 to 5 mg IV or 0.05 mg per kilogram IV for children until reaching the adult dose. If the patient does not respond to the treatment, double the dose every 3 to 5 minutes until respiratory secretions have cleared and there is no bronchoconstriction. In patients with severe poisoning, it may take hundreds of milligrams of atropine given in bolus or continuous infusion over several days before the patient improves. Some authors recommend giving atropine until signs of atropinization appear. These signs include warm, dry, flushed skin, dilated pupils, and an increased heart rate. Atropine should be used for at least 24 hours to reverse the cholinergic signs while the organophosphate is metabolized. To learn more about the action of atropine please refer to our video on the atropine mechanism. For now, let's focus on organophosphate poisoning. Now, the next step to take is to secure the airway of patient. One of the first choice is endotracheal intubation and use of sedatives. Airway control is vital. In some patients, intubation may be required due to bronchospasm, seizures or bronchorrhea. During intubation, succinylcholine must be avoided as it may prolong the paralysis. The reason is that succinylcholine is also degraded by acetylcholine esterase. Good intravenous access, cardiac monitoring, and pulse oximetry are the standard of care. Next, after the atropinization of patient and securing the airway, we need to analyze the patient's serum cholinesterase level. 
but what's cholinesterase and how it get affected in OPP poisoning? For this, we need to understand the pathophysiology of OPP poisoning. Organophosphate molecules can be absorbed via the skin, inhalation, or in the gastrointestinal tract. Once absorbed, the molecule binds to an acetylcholinesterase molecule in red blood cells thus making the enzyme inactive. This leads to an overabundance of acetylcholine within synapses and neuromuscular junctions. Overstimulation of nicotinic receptors found at neuromuscular junctions can lead to fasciculations and myoclonic jerks. This eventually leads to flaccid paralysis because of the depolarizing block. Nicotinic receptors also are found in the adrenal glands which may cause hypertension, sweating, tachycardia, and leukocytosis with left shift. Today there is a portable test that can measure ache in red blood cells within minutes. The blood must be drawn before pralidoxime is administered. Other blood work that should be ordered include CBC, glucose levels, troponin, liver and renal function, and arterial blood gas. The ECG will reveal sinus bradycardia due to the parasympathetic activation. The next step in the management of OPP poisoning is the use of PAM or pralidoxime. So let's understand how PAM acts and the dosing of PAM in OPP poisoning. Remember, as we have discussed, PAM should be administered only when blood is withdrawn for serum acetylcholinesterase level. Pralidoxime, also called 2-PAM, should be given to affect the nicotinic receptor since atropine only works on muscarinic receptors. Pralidoxime works by reactivating the phosphorylated acetylcholinesterase by binding to the organophosphate. However, to work it has to be given within 48 hours of the poisoning. The agent does not depress the respiratory center and can be combined with atropine. Now, let's focus on doses of PAM in organophosphate poisoning. 1 to 2 gram IV infusion over 15 to 30 minutes should be given primarily, then repeat in 1 hour if necessary. If pulmonary edema present or fluid restriction necessary, administer as 50 mg per milliliter over 5 minutes, then a second bolus of 1 to 2 gram may be indicated after about 1 hour if muscle weakness has not been relieved. Alternatively, administer 30 mg per kilogram IV over 20 minutes, followed by 4 to 8 mg per kilogram per hour maintenance IV infusion. Now, what to do in case of PAM toxicity? In this case is acetylcholinesterase inhibitor toxicity agents such as nystigmine, pyridostigmine can be used. In case of renal impairment, reduce doses. Globally, organophosphate insecticides have mortality rates that vary from 2 to 25%. The most common insecticides involved in death are phenytrothian, dichlorvos, malathion, and trichlorphan. The most common cause of death is respiratory failure. To learn more about different types of poisoning presence in emergency room and management protocol, please subscribe and support us. Thank you.